Hi everybody, welcome back. This is the last part of this series. I'll be glad to get this off the bench because I got so many other things to do. Uh, I just, those covers on this, especially the bottom one, was just so bad. I couldn't let it go like that. The rest of this amp was so nice. I was able to get the front part straightened out a little bit. It's not perfect, but it's good enough. I mean, it's a lot better than it was. Everything else looks good. Um, to paint this, I ended up, you know, I could have sent it out and spent a lot more money, but there's enough money tied up in this amp, I didn't want to get any more. So I did the old rattle can thing, and I was really surprised when I was at the uh, hardware store looking at the different types of paints, I found this blue-gray color. And when I saw this color, I thought, wow, that's going to look really nice with this amp. So I decided to give it a shot, and uh, I used a... A bonding primer under it and I was really surprised at the quality for just spray cans outside <laughs> you know I had a really nice Saturday that the weather was really cooperative and the wind was way down and it was just perfect and uh, look at look at how this turned out I mean I'm not a good painter by any stretch of the imagination I'm terrible at it but I kind of even surprised myself how nicely this turned out so it looks good and I like the color and um, the underneath I just painted bl gloss black again the underneath had a lot of pitting and rust it didn't turn out quite as good as this because it was very hard I had to sand it down pretty aggressively um, I didn't really do any puttying on it or anything like that with filler I did use some scratch filling uh, primer that helped but it's not as perfect as this but it turned out okay it looks pretty good so uh, the amp is all done and all that's left to do is just do some audio tests on it and some performance evaluations to make sure it's working up to par and after that uh, we'll send it on its way and I have another project that I'm doing uh, I have a relative that's going to be coming up to pick something up that I found in an antique store for him and he's going to pick it up and I want to get the amplifier done on it and the amplifier to me is absolutely fascinating the electronics the way it was designed I think it'll make a good video so I decided I'm going to do a video out of that and that's what's going to be next after this so enough talk let's check this thing out and see how it works okay the first thing if you remember the volume control on this is not really a stepped attenuator but it works like one it has detents on the volume and if you if you go back one video to where I did the cleaning of the control you could see how there were little steps in the carbon tracks on there that, that lined up with the detents on this so even though it is a potentiometer it works kind of like a stepped attenuator and the thing I don't like about those is whenever you have these you know 24 steps is never enough and that's the average for a stepped attenuator and they have a logarithmic taper so at the very at the first half of the rotation you know each step is just a slight increase in volume but still it's not always slight enough and not every one of these amplifiers that are out there have a variable gain like this like a, a an attenuation and this one has not only one gain level but it has two different ones other than the default so you have zero which is the standard volume level you have a minus 10 db and you have a plus 10 db gain and that's wonderful because you can make the accuracy of this volume knob however you want so if you want to listen to it low levels you could use the minus 10 db setting if you want to listen to it at high levels or have high gain you go up you know to plus or you can leave it at zero and it'll work normally I love that um, if you're gonna have a stepped attenuator or a detented volume control this is the way to go to have with it so anyway I'm gonna go with the minus 10 DB so that we have kind of more precise adjustment of our volume and the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna put a 1 kilohertz sine wave and I'm just gonna look at the power output I'm gonna look at the total harmonic distortion out to the fifth harmonic and then we're also just going to look at kind of where it flat tops and where you know how 
what our maximum power is. So I have everything set up. I have an 8 ohm dummy load connected. And remember, we have our new modules in there, so kind of we're evaluating those a little bit too. So let's turn the volume up. I'm at 20 volts per division, so you can actually see the RMS voltage, and that's what we're really interested in. And these two lines are the actual wattage going into the 8 ohm load. The purple line is the right channel, the tan line is the left channel, and when you see them separate, that's the little tiny differences that you have in the pots. So you can see how they kind of go in and out of being together on each detent. And that's just a, you know, if this was an actual stepped attenuator, they would stay together the whole way. So if you look, each graticule is 10 watts for these lines. So 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 watts is the maximum. So it'll go off scale when we hit max power. But we can still do the math by using the uh, RMS value and doing the traditional algebraic equation. So here we go. Right there's 75 watts per channel, 80, or I'm sorry, 65 watts, 70, 80 watts, and we're kind of off the charts now. And here, remember this is a 90 watt per channel receiver. Right there's about where it's going to top out. And we have 29.8 volts. Okay. So 29.8 volts is our maximum. And you can see doing the math that comes out at 111 watts. Not bad for a 90 watt receiver. Now, what I'm going to do now is we're gonna bring up our 111 watts and we're gonna watch what happens to our distortion. And let's see what kind of distortion it keeps at maximum power. So here we go, it's gonna jump around a little bit. And if I go up, you can see there's like nothing there right now. The meter can't even hardly read anything. And I'm already at 40 watts per channel. There's 50 watts per channel, 60, 75, 80 watts. And right, going into clipping now, coming off of clipping. Right there is 111 watts. Not bad. 111 watts, that's very good. So, uh, one of the features that they said uh, that came with these pyramid audio modules was they were supposed to have reduced total harmonic distortion from the original. Darlington power packs that were in there, which is these ones here, these complementary packs. And uh, as you can see, the distortion figures are fantastic. Okay, for this next test, I've changed the camera angle. And I hope you can see everything. Yeah, I should be able to. And what we're going to do is we're going to compare the watt meters to the oscilloscope because this is very accurate. And we're just going to see if the watt meters need to be adjusted. So let's go up here and turn the volume up. And if I go, I'm going to just put 10 watts on here for right now, or close to it. Right there's 10 watts. Okay, you can see the meter is right at 10 watts. And you can see we're very close. Okay. And if I go, the next notch is 30 watts, so if I go up to 30, which is right around there, it's right on 30. So I would say there's 70, and we're right on 70. So the meters are working perfectly. Okay, the next thing I have is 20 hertz. We're just going to see if we can get our full 100 and, what is it, 111 watts at 20 hertz because we don't want it to distort before that. So right, right about there, and yep, 29.7. And if we look, distortion looks great. You know, usually at low frequencies like that, you get a little more distortion than at uh, 1 kilohertz. Now I'm going to go to 20 kilohertz. 
120 kilohertz, that is. And I'm going to just spread this out a little bit so we can see it like that. And we're going to take this up. This is not good on an amp, so don't do this for very long if you're going to do it. So, yep, and it's holding up pretty good, too. <laughs> Look at the distortion. <laughs> wow. Yeah, this is a really, really, really clean amp. And I can tell you, I did try this out with music, and I've played uh, probably about a half an hour at pretty high volume level with uh, different types of music and this thing is a really smooth sounding amplifier. It, it has a ton of punch. You really don't need tone controls and you don't need a loudness switch on this amp. It is so perfectly balanced. It, it passes the sound so perfectly that you really don't need any of that. And of course I have the reverse on, which doesn't matter. It's just it'll do the same thing. Okay, we're now going to do a dynamic power test. I have a 100 hertz signal and what we're going to do is I'm going to set this on just a slow scan, single trace, and we're going to check dynamic power. And what that means is if we have an instantaneous burst of sound that's way above uh, you know the maximum output of the output of the amp how much can it exceed its maximum power for short durations this is important because this is going to tell you how how much it can handle a transient like a you know like a real hard kick drum or a real heavy bass passage that only lasts for a split second okay and so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to turn the signal generator on for about a second and then turn it back off. And you're going to see the beginning of the waveform should overshoot the waveform and then it should flatten out. And that's the absolute maximum that the rails can handle because the caps are discharging and the power supply can't keep up with the capacitors anymore. So that's what we're going to check. So this is for dynamic power. So we're going to hit this. Turn it on, boom, turn it off. Like I said, you don't want to leave this on for very long. And you can see this is your maximum clipping power. So this is, you know, that 111 watts per channel that you think, you know, that we were measuring. But you can see this can actually exceed that by quite a bit for just an instantaneous second. And that's what you want to see. If if this were squared off all the time, that means that there's no extra headroom in your power supply. So this is showing that the power supply is well suited to the amplifier. The amplifier slew rate, and this scope makes it very easy. You don't even have to use the cursors because it actually can show you the rise time. So all you need to do is figure out the voltage and then what the rise time is and <laughs> it's right there. So here we go. So I'm going to go all the way up as high as this will go. Hit stop. And you can see our rise time is about somewhere between 2.5 and 2.682 microseconds. So Here's your rise time. It's 2. Point, let's say 2.6 microseconds, we'll call that. And the rise time from here all the way up to here, we're looking at how many volts per division are we? We're 20 volts per division, so 20, 40, 60, 80 volts. Okay. And we just do the math. It's simple math. So if we look at that roughly 80 volts and roughly 2.6 we'll call it that comes out to 30.77 volts per microsecond and that's really good so almost 31 volts per microsecond so that's a pretty good rise time for this amp so the slew rate is very good
Okay, this is the beauty of having two oscilloscopes, is you don't have to mess around with the settings on your other one. Now what we're going to do is we're going to test the output of the, and the performance of the phono preamp. And if you recall from previous videos, which you may not because you may not have watched them, is that there is a certain curve, and I'm not going to get into this on, on this video. You can go back and watch the video on, uh, I'll put it up on the screen here when I remember. It was a, several videos. Oh, I know what it was. I think it, I did this test on the Pioneer SX1250 where we tested the phono stage. But essentially at 20 hertz, 1 kilohertz, and 20, 20 kilohertz, you should have three different gain levels and they should be a gain of 10 times apart from one another, or plus and minus 20 dB. So essentially, right now we are at 20 hertz and you can see on the screen I have 20 hertz and I have the input level of the phono cartridge, of where the phono cartridge would be plugged in into the phono stage. I have about a little over eight and a half millivolts RMS. And I'm not going to change that right now. That is giving us, with you know, with the gain and the preamp and everything, a very level five volts output. Okay, so you can see we're getting five volts out with that 8.7 millivolts in. Now, what should happen is if I increase the frequency from 20 hertz to one kilohertz, this should go up by a factor of 10, or go down by a factor of 10. So instead of being five volts, it should be 0.5 volts or 500 millivolts. So let's do that. Okay, so frequency, one kilohertz. And you could see right away it drops. And we're gonna have to change the scale. And you can see we have about 550 millivolts. So it's close, it's not perfect. And remember, the RIAA curve is not a linear slope. It is a curve. It does have some hysteresis to it. So just remember that. And then when we go to 20 kilohertz, and this is going to have all kinds of noise on it because my scope is quite noisy. But Again, we should have somewhere around, let's see if I can get the trigger to behave. And the scope is aliasing right now. This is one of the <laughs> problems of a digital scope. But we should have somewhere around 50 millivolts RMS. And I'm pretty sure we do in here. If we freeze frame, and you could see 59 about 60 millivolts so it's just a little bit high but basically you should have have 50 millivolts 500 millivolts and 5,000 millivolts or 5 volts at 20 kilohertz 1 kilohertz and 20 hertz so what this is telling me is that the you know without doing an extensive test or doing a Bode plot or anything like that we know that the phono stage is working properly and the filters in it are working properly. So it has the proper de-emphasis curve on it, and this is a very good thing. So we know our phono stage is working. And I have a very small signal, it's millivolts going into it, and we're reading out a very low signal, and that's why my scope is aliasing and going crazy and doing all kinds of stuff. So, phono stage is good. And wouldn't you know, as soon as I get ready to record something, the fan kicks on and the blower for the air conditioning. It's another, another hot day today, so we're going to have to listen to that in the background. But let's uh, make sure our stranger danger test passes.
sounds pretty good. I will see how our little lapel microphone works. <laughs> this thing surprises me how well it records. All of the music you hear, hear me record um, when I play this live, you know, and record it on camera, it's through that lapel microphone. And just so you know, um, I purchased, I have a spare one. I like it so much that I actually bought a spare one and they had them on Amazon and they come in these little packets of packages comes with some accessories comes in a little carrying case and it's USB rechargeable it's an electric microphone you can see it even has you know for voice and for uh, flat you know record curve and uh, camera and phone mode eight dollars these were on sale no kidding so you're listening to an eight dollar microphone <laughs> and uh, you know I've had all kinds of microphones I've tried on this on my videos and none of them perform as well as this one I mean it's wired um, I don't like wireless microphones they tend to have problems sometimes they pick up interference and different things but this thing has been great and I've had it for years and it's just pretty good so let's turn the light back on here take a last look at it and this one's ready to go I think so that's a wrap I mean you know you could do a lot more extensive testing on this but you pretty much know when when something's right you can hear it you can tell so there's a few tests that uh, that you can do on, uh, and I've shown these so many times in other, you know, on other videos. So anyway, let's wrap this up. I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. And uh, stick around because uh, lots more videos to come. I'm going to get this tube amplifier up here on a bench, and I'm really excited about it because again, it is a design I've never seen before. And it's something very unique. And uh, no, it's not not a regular stereo amp. It's actually out of a uh, Leslie organ speaker. But very fascinating how they designed it. So anyhow, until then, I wish you all well. And we'll be back real soon. Bye-bye.